from the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco. This is the Wednesday Yachting Lunch, hosted by Ron Young. So welcome to our Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Fun to be to live meetings again. Our grill room will be back in service in a couple of months, we're told. Nobody knows for sure until the contractor kind of gets into it. But it's just completely appropriate after Oppenheimer won, I guess it was seven Oscars, that we would have our speaker plan today. Now you're saying that's incredible planning, Wednesday Yachting Luncheon Committee. What amazing planning, uh, of course, with such foresight. Um, so our speaker today is one fascinating human as you'll get to see. Uh, born in the mountains of South Carolina, uh, you'd say to yourself, boy, that's got to be kind of like your little uh, quiet place off to the side. But he would then go to Kate School in Santa Barbara. Those of us who've had buddies at Kate know it's a yeah. supremely good school. From there, he'd go off to Stanford to get a bachelor's in international relations. And then uh, spend some time with the World Affairs Council. There's a place for some thoughtful discussion. And then go to... Uh, uh, spent some time at the London School of Economics where he got a master's in international relations and then went to the Center for Strategic Studies in DC. He's been think tank oriented pretty much his whole career between universities and think tanks. They would go to Erasmus University where he'd get a PhD in Rotterdam. Those of us who've been to Rotterdam know they make incredibly great yachts there as well. Um, then he spent some time uh, on the Potomac sailing around in uh, uh, different kinds of dinghies, pelicans, and albacores, and things like that, and spent time at the Institute for Defense Technologies, became an adjunct professor at George Washington University on international relations, and in 2009, President Obama picked him to be the senior civilian's advisor on nuclear armaments and defense postures therein. Um, he became an expert in nuclear deterrence and can speak at great length and will speak at great length about it and how valuable it is and how important it is. He would then come back to the coast here and be an adjunct professor at Stanford where he wrote a book on this topic. And in the 47,000 books written by academics on academic topics that year, his was he won the Choice Award. That's a pretty big deal. It was such a popular book that the... Uh, uh, the academics thought to themselves, you know, it's very rare that an academic book in this big, you know, 47,000 would actually win the choice award, but he did win that. He then went on to Lawrence Livermore Lab, uh, where he works for the, as director of the Center for Global Strategic Research. And we in this yacht club remember the first press conference at this club was in 85, right here, in fact, filled with members of the press. And we announced that we had recruited from uh, Lawrence Livermore Labs, one Heiner Meldner, who had two PhDs, one in physics, one in math, and he would become the uh, computational fluid dynamicist. That's a guy who uses computers to look at the analysis normally done in testing tanks to shape, to evaluate the shape of underwater objects and, and above water foils as well. And with that, we would develop the first bulbed keel shown on USA right over there. And since that development of the first bulbed keel on a sailboat, every racing monohull on the planet, and, es and especially all the record setters, have had bulbed keels. So it was a revolutionary design that we got from a comrade, a colleague, <laughs> Different, different thing, a colleague at, at uh, Lawrence Livermore Lab. So it's uh, with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker today, Brad, Brad Roberts. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to join you. Uh, thank you for making the time. Thank you for joining in a discussion of a pretty grim topic. Uh, and uh, I see my role here today as being essentially to help you all make sense of the, the, the more frequent data points we get in newspapers and television today about nuclear things. We didn't have to think about them for a long time. And obviously, they're popping back up in, in, in the news. Uh, and to help you make sense of the policy debate uh, about uh, does this need to be closer? Um, 
to make sense of the policy debate uh, about nuclear deterrence today. Uh, and I should be clear that I'm expressing my personal views here today. I'm not here on behalf of Lawrence Livermore Laboratory or any of its sponsors. Uh, and I don't have PowerPoint slides. I, I apologize for that. It's, it's sort of illegal for a Department of Energy person to turn up without PowerPoint. But um, uh, I turned up at work yesterday and my hard drive wasn't there, so, um, so I have no PowerPoint today. But um, every administration is required in its first year by the Congress to issue a national security strategy. And there are many striking similarities between the national security strategies of the Trump and Biden administrations. I know that's counterintuitive, but it's true nonetheless. Now, their strategies for dealing with the environment are quite different, but their view of the security environment, summarized in the single term from uh, the Biden document, that we're at an inflection point, an inflection point. Uh, and by that, the, 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 the president and the administration argued that we're in a, quote, decisive decade in which the choices we as a nation make will influence our peace and prosperity for many decades to come. Uh, and it's this context that we need to have in mind when we drill down and look at the nuclear questions. Uh, what, what are the key attributes of this inflection point? Well, the first is the turn by the leaders of Russia and China away from the cooperation that prevailed in the 1990s and towards competition, rivalry, and even direct confrontation. A journey that Russia's made a little more than China, but they're still headed in the same basic direction. Uh, President Putin has been very open and explicit about his view of the global environment and the, the strategy of encirclement, containment, and defeat that he sees us imposing upon Russia. Uh, and in 2014, when he explained why he felt it necessary to take Crimea back, he did so under a banner that said, new rules or no rules. And he's been living the no rules world, world ever since. And President Xi has spoken about an Asia for Asians and a new harmonious international order where the major powers basically stick to their own regions. Uh, and he's talked about um, China seeking a place at the center of the world stage and sometimes he's quoted as also saying, in the dominant position. Uh, so if the first key attribute of this new security environment is this turn for the worse in major power relations, what, what else should we be thinking about? Second key factor is the rise of aspiring powers in the so-called global south, some of whom are significantly revisionist in their political agendas. Uh, North Korea is a rising aspirant power that seeks to completely revise the security order, the political order on the Korean Peninsula and in Northeast Asia. A third key factor, U.S. allies, anxious. Uh, I spend a lot of time with allies in, in both Europe and Asia. I spent last Monday all day with a delegation from the government of Finland uh, which we can no longer say is NATO's newest member, uh, Sweden having finally joined. But, um, uh, and the week before, I spent a lot of time with a Japanese group. Uh, and and these, these allies are, I mean, the Swedes and Finns joined NATO essentially because of the nuclear protection. They felt they had a good conventional defense against Russia, but they didn't have an answer for the, the new nuclear coercive actions of President Putin. Uh, and they want to know, they, the Finns, the, the Swedes, the Germans, the Czechs, the Lithuanians, the Japanese, the South Koreans, the Australians, all want to know that America's commitment to them 
is still good enough for them to bet their national survival on because that's what they've done. And they worry. Uh, a, f a fourth key factor is, of course, in this security environment, we have some cross-cutting challenges that need cooperative action. We're not going to be effective in dealing with global warming if all we do is reduce emissions in California. Uh, some form of international cooperation is needed on some major international problems today. And if a final and key factor, which we Americans typically don't discuss, but if we were in a setting in any of those other countries I just mentioned, they, at the top of their list would be America as a factor in the security environment. Unpredictable as ever, more divided than ever, questions about our reliability, questions about our power, questions about our resolve. We are divided and ambivalent and may lurch in an entirely new direction soon. And this, 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 of course, impacts all these other, the four other factors. Now, all of these factors have nuclear implications and aspects. Uh, and I think it's useful to think in, in the following way about this policy discussion. When the Cold War ended, one chapter in U.S. nuclear policy history closed. And changes in the international environment opened up a new chapter. And we were able to do all sorts of things in the nuclear policy realm that we had wanted to do but not been able to do. We ended the arms race. We stood the nuclear force down from alert. We reduced the numbers and types of nuclear weapons. We built verifiable arms control regime uh, instruments with uh, Russia. And we managed to extend and strengthen the nuclear nonproliferation regime. In 1995, a decision had to be taken about whether or not to sustain the NPT. And that decision was taken. That chapter was defined also by the need to a, a deal to shift our deterrence strategy onto a new problem, Saddam Hussein. Rogue states, long-range missiles, WMD, all of that stuff. A new problem for deterrence. And it compelled a new way of thinking about deterrence. Because in the Cold War, we had come to accept with Russia mutual assured destruction, MAD. There was no escaping it. We didn't like it. But it was what it was, and it was in our interest that Russia, that the Soviets feel that they didn't have to go first in a, in a, in a war, go first with nuclear weapons. But in the 1990s with rogue states, we said, We're, we, don't, we don't think these, the leaders of North Korea and, and Iran are deterrable in the usual way, and we don't want to have a relationship of mutual nuclear vulnerability with them. We want to close them out. Missile defense non-nuclear strike, long intercontinental range, non-nuclear strike systems. And in major power relations in this period, we tried to put the focus, we tried to take it off of our deterrence relationship with Russia and China and put it onto our common interest in a stable strategic relationship. Well, already by the time I was in the Pentagon, 2009 to 2013, there were storm clouds on the horizon. This wasn't working out very well for us. Uh, you may recall the Obama administration's reset button. I mean, what needed to be reset? Well, the U.S.-Russian relationship had deteriorated pretty badly by this point. So then came 2014, and th this chapter, and, and the, the annexation of Crimea, uh, and a call by uh, the President and the Secretary of Defense for for a new deterrence playbook to deal with the new wor world, quote unquote. Uh, so the, the chapter that began in 1990 has been ending. And many of the things that we now have to do are things we don't want to do, that are politically unpopular, that take us out of our comfort zone. But what are some of the, the new challenges in this new era? Well, 
The first comes from Russia's military modernization. And by this, I don't just mean hardware, although there's a lot of hardware. Uh, in 2011, the president of uh, the, the chairman of the Russian nuclear weapons complex said, President Putin has asked us to build a nuclear scalpel for every military problem in Europe. But it's not just hardware, it's software. The Russians came up with uh, an answer to the problem they fear that they face, which is a, a war that we bring to them. And th their way of thinking about this is to say, uh, in any war between Russia and the United States in Europe, Russian interests will be vital and America's interests will be darned important but not vital. That there's an asymmetry of stake which they can awaken us to by taking escalatory acts in a crisis in war to, f to compel us to face the fact that we, we don't, we're, we're not going to think we have that dog in that fight and we'll back down. Their shorthand for this is that they, will, they can employ non-strategic nuclear weapons, so tactical weapons, to sober but not enrage us, that there's some sweet spot there. It's an interesting misreading of democracies, but, but there it is. So Russia put its intellectual house in order in the 1990s and 2000s, issued new military doctrine under Putin's signature in 2010, and has been assembling the means for regional war with acts of limited escalation to sober but not enrage us. Not to attack the American homeland. Well, maybe by cyber means, maybe to attack space assets, but direct strikes on the American homeland, especially with nuclear weapons, are not a part of their vision. Unless we go to their homeland. China, different timeline, same basic pathway. Uh, China was highly motivated by the Taiwan Strait missile crisis of 1995 and 6. Any American who remembers that, especially our many naval participants today, will recall that we dispatched a carrier battle group to show the American flag. What every Chinese scholar remembers is a second carrier battle group was dispatched. That wasn't for showing the flag. That was for making war. And they looked around and they looked at the Persian Gulf War and said, if we get into a war with America, we'll get slaughtered the way the Iraqis did. We need to fix this. How did they begin to fix it? Well, with a strategy that sounds a lot like sober but not enraged. They too believe that in a conflict over Taiwan, the interests at stake will asymmetrically favor them and they can escalate enough to make us back down and not run a significant risk of our response. And so in recent years, they've built up their nuclear forces very substantially. You may recall the, nuclear, the, the newspaper reports of two summers ago when we discovered that they had built, well, back one step. When I started working on the U.S.-China nuclear relationship in 1995, they had 18 missiles with nuclear weapons capable of reaching the American homeland. Uh, we, we discovered 300 silos being built in, in the desert two years ago, uh, and, the, and we've detected the signs of a massive buildup of new nuclear weapons. Uh, and I just returned Saturday from the 20th annual round of unofficial nuclear discourse with the People's Liberation Army. Uh, we were in Shanghai last Thursday and Friday. And they said, well, we feel better now that we have this additional force of nuclear weapons targeting you, but we're still not sure it's enough because your capabilities to target us are improving faster than our capabilities are growing. We're going to keep going. North Korea. Uh, we all hoped that North Korea would stop short of the nuclear threshold. Kim Jong-un raced right across and has kept going and is building up. 
uh, January 1st, a year ago, he committed to a significant increase in China's force of tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, the, uh, and he made an explicit statement that uh, the role of nuclear weapons in North Korean strategy is to deter attack on North Korea. But, he said, there's a hidden second purpose, which I will not reveal to you, but which anyone would understand who is unhappy with the situation on the ground where they live. Well, uh, and last, uh, two weeks ago, he was asked by a journalist, um, so now that you've built up your nuclear force, are you, are you prepared to seek a deal on the Korean Peninsula and the ultimate reconciliation of the two sides? And he said, no, we're still at war. I want to win. That was a pretty clear answer. Fourth, Iran. Uh, Iran is walking right up to the nuclear threshold and is, seems destined to walk right across and keep going. Uh, this raises all sorts of problematic questions for the United States, for Israel, for, for, for Europe, and for Iran's immediate neighbors. Uh, I was saying earlier at the table that uh, uh, I, I had a, a, a quotation that I often referenced from the Speaker of the Iranian Parliament in 2006. And he was asked by a journalist, does Iran want the bomb? And he said, well, of course we do. Look at the neighborhood we live in. Look at our relationship with the great Satan. And we would really love to be the second and last country in our region to get nuclear weapons. But that's not the real choice, he said. The real choice is between a cascade that would follow Iran's getting the bomb or just continued progress towards having the bomb. And if Iran crosses the threshold, uh, the Saudis are likely to not be far behind. The Egyptians might not be far behind. I mean, the Algerians. Uh, there have been nuclear weapons programs in a number of countries in, in that region. And so in the, in the study of nuclear proliferation, there's a reference point to tipping points and the cascades that follow. And if Iran crosses the nuclear threshold, we can expect a cascade in the Middle East and the spillover effects in other regions. Another new nuclear challenge relates to the, the changing nature of strategic conflict. We, we all grew up in a time when there, there was conventional war and then the strategic nuclear problem sort of on top of it. And we, equi we, we use almost interchangeably the words strategic and nuclear. But the, the strategic toolkit is growing with new technologies and their military applications. So people are thinking more about strategic as being the tools of influence that promise a, an immediate and decisive effect on an adversary's will to fight. Cyber, large-scale cyber attacks can offer such influence. Counter space capabilities, take out all the satellites in the low, lower, lower Earth orbits, uh, would have a huge impact on our societies, economies, and militaries. Um, missile defense in its own way has an impact on the effects of nuclear deterrence. Deep precision strike, like the kind that will become available to us with hypersonic cruise missiles uh, that Russia and China are already deploying and we are not. Uh, all of this adds a whole new layer of war where we're competing, the three major powers are competing to, to sustain our security and, and frankly to gain advantage. We all three articulate supremacy or primacy or strategic advantage over others as our goals in cyberspace, outer space, and AI. So this is the new problem of multi-domain competition and conflict. Uh, one, one more key challenge in this long list is the end of the arms control business. 
19, go back to the beginning of ni- the, the, the chapter now ending, ni- 1990-91. We, we had in place the Treaty on Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces in Europe, the um, Conventional Forces in Europe Agreement, the, what else did we have? We had the, the START Agreement, the Strategic Arms Reductions Treaty, the Vienna and Helsinki documents about um, um, the use of force and not, not taking an, an, any territory by force. Uh, and in addition, from earlier decades, we had the Open Skies Treaty, the Outer Space Treaty, and the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty. Uh, of all of those things, only a couple are left standing. Uh, the INF Treaty collapsed under the weight of Russian violations and then American withdrawal. The, co- the Conventional Forces in Europe Treaty has essentially collapsed with Russian withdrawal. Uh, uh, the, w- the Open Skies Treaty, the U.S. Withdraw after decades, withdrew after decades of Russian cheating. The Outer Space Treaty is intended to keep nuclear weapons out of space. We see Russia and China testing such capabilities. And the Anti-Ballistic Missile tra- Treaty, we left because we wanted protection from states, rogue states like Iraq and Iran and North Korea with missiles and WMD. What's left is the New START Treaty, which is the treaty that limits the intercontinental range weapons of Russia and the United States. Uh, Russia has already suspended its participation. The treaty formally collapses, ends, terminates in 2026, and there's no successor in sight. There's no concept for a successor in sight. So that chapter that began in 1990-91, we're in a new chapter now. And the things we had the opportunity to do in 91 were all things we wanted to do. The things we have to do in the decade ahead are all things we'd really rather not do. Um, spend money, uh, instead of fewer weapons, more. Instead of old weapons, new. Instead of arms control with the Russians and Chinese competition with them. Uh, instead of fewer nuclear weapons in Europe and Asia, more. Uh, and these are all politically difficult things for us to master. Where do, where do we stand overall? Well, I've tried to make the point a couple of times that the homeland isn't the first point that's vulnerable in this nuclear order. Our allies are vulnerable. Our forces overseas are vulnerable. Our security commitments are vulnerable. Our credibility is vulnerable. But I think an attack on the American homeland with nuclear weapons is substantially less plausible than it was during the Cold War. This is because deterrence is working at that level. We have a credible threat to respond if attacked. And um, the weakness in our deterrent posture is not in the strategic forces, it's in the, the theater forces. When the Cold War ended, we brought home from Europe 97% of the weapons we had deployed there. There were thousands. And we brought home all of the nuclear weapons from anywhere else in the world. And we removed them from naval surface combatants and removed them from naval attack submarines, put them into storage, and said we, we might redeploy them, to, particularly to Northeast Asia, in time of war if needed. And then in 2010, we retired those because they were age, aged, aged out. And our allies in Northeast Asia say, You've promised that you can extend the nuclear umbrella on our behalf. Where where are the capabilities that you're going to do that with? And how are you going to operate against China's thousands of theater range missiles? Uh, This is a good question. Uh, There have been two recent commissions that have looked at parts of this that that are not reassuring. One is the National Defense Strategy Commission Uh, The Congress, as I said, obliges each new president to write a national security strategy. 
The Congress also obliges each new administration to issue a new defense strategy that aligns with the security strategy. And then the Congress receives the defense strategy and turns around and hands it to a group of 12 people, six Democrats, six Republicans, friendly, roughly speaking, to American defense interests, and asks them, what do you think? And then six months later, they issue a report. And in 2018, they said about the Trump strategy, great strategy, but if we have to go to war tomorrow against a nuclear-armed adversary, we would lose. And the reason we would lose is we don't understand the nature of the war they have prepared to bring to us, and we are reliant on out-escalating them to win, which could be a catastrophe for us, especially if they believe their interests are more vital than ours. So get to work on thinking about this problem of escalation, is what the Commission said. And there's been some work. And then uh, the Congress appointed a Strategic Posture Commission, uh, a, a bipartisan group, and that word doesn't quite capture it. This is the most effective representation of all of the views in our political spectrum on nuclear policy, from the Trump faction through the traditional Republicans, through the pragmatists in the Obama years, out to the progressives in the, in the Biden years. And in their report issued in October, they agreed on everything that they wrote about. Uh, an inspiring moment in our American political life. And their, their principal findings were that the, the strategic nuclear forces of the United States are fit for purpose, but will become less so as China's force grows, and so we need to grow our own force. But that our extended nuclear deterrent, the protection we provide to our allies, is not fit for purpose, and will become ever less so in the years ahead. So they argued the current program to replace our aging nuclear weapons with modern versions uh, is inadequate. Something more or different is needed. And just to be clear about that, um, the newest part of the nuclear triad is the submarine fleet the ballistic missile submarines. They went into service in the 1980s, 16 months apart. They're going to start going out of service 16 months apart in two years. And whatever we do about it, we're going to be without those submarines. And the successors have been slipping on schedule, of course. And those are the newest parts of the, the, the nuclear deterrent. Uh, the, the ICBMs, the land-based missiles, the newest of those went in, the newest went into the ground in 1972. And the newest B-52 flying the nuclear mission went into service in 1962. The last time the United States built a new nuclear weapon was 1991. Those weapons were all built for a, a shelf life of about 20 years. And you can see we're well beyond that. So we have, as a nation, begun to replace these aging systems with modern successors, but we're simply recreating the aging force rather than, to, than producing a new force fit for a different world. So in closing, let me just come back to my, my main argument for you to keep in mind, and that's that the, the, the chapter in U.S. nuclear policy that began when the Cold War ended, when we were all able to take a, a nice summer siesta on nuclear things, uh, that chapter began to close in 2014 and is now closed. And we're in a new period where many of the nuclear policy decisions in front of the nation are very difficult uh, politically, financially, uh, but if we don't make them, we're going to find ourselves missing the required decisions in the in, at the inflection point and ending up in a world much more hostile to our interests and much more dangerous than the one that's already dangerous enough. So with that, let me thank you for your attention, and uh, we'll turn to the discussion. <clears throat> Thank you.
Also, our partners, the Navy League, want to give our guest a bottle. So Angus, uh, Black, uh, Blackwood of the Navy League president, wants to give a gift. Go ahead, Angus. You have the table on the floor. The San Francisco Navy League was formed five years before Pearl Harbor to educate the public on the need to increase our military readiness. Here in 2024, the San Francisco Navy League reaffirms that commitment, working in partnership with the St. Francis Yacht Club Wednesday Yachting Luncheon to bring Navy, Marine Corps, and national security speakers to St. Francis members, Navy League members, in the public. On behalf of the San Francisco Navy League, I'd like to present you a bottle of sextant wine, something we can all adore, a sextant. And thank you, Dr. Roberts, for, bring, for speaking to us today. Thanks. Great, thank you, thank you buddy. Thank you. Thank you. Great, thanks, Angus. Do I have to share this with everybody? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Brad, uh, quickly name the nuclear states now. Who is in the scary family of nuclear states? And then I'm going to ask who's next. The original five that were nuclear weapon states when the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty was agreed in 1969. Okay, that's America, Russia, China. Britain and Britain, France. Britain and France, okay. And then, allegedly... Israel came next. Okay, six. Uh, then, um, in in order, then then uh, in India, Pakistan, uh, and then North Korea. Who could be next? Who's closest? Well, first of all, there's a, an interesting pattern about the that sequence, which was each new country was helped by somebody who'd already crossed the threshold. And, and there's an interesting question about who might help the next country. That's one of my questions, actually. Um, because so far, at least in the period after the Cold War, well, since the signing of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, there's been a big taboo against helping other countries get nuclear weapons. And an understanding that that point made by the Iranian Speaker of the Parliament is valid. The, the next Proliferation Act could trigger a whole cascade that would worsen everybody's security, including the state that was trying to get an advantage by getting a nuclear weapon. So it's not clear to me that there's aid forthcoming to the next actor, although potentially North Korea could aid some country and appeared engaged in aid to Syria. Uh, there was a facility in the Syrian desert that bore a striking resemblance to a North Korean facility that was wiped out by the Israelis one day and then plowed under by the Syrians. Uh, so some aid is possible. Who's next? Well, the betting, of course, is Iran. Mm -hmm. So given that Pakistan helped North Korea, um, did we not know that was happening? Were there debates in the Pentagon? Were there those who said Pakistan is helping the North Koreans and others who said they weren't? Or were we totally blindsided? I wouldn't say we were totally blindsided, I wouldn't, but I would say there was disagreement about what the intelligence indicated, uh, and, and there was in any case uh, uh, unless we were willing to engage in the use of force, uh, there, there was no decisive means to influence any proliferator who's committed. We can raise the costs for them economically, politically, diplomatically. But unless we're willing to take military action, the rest of that may not offer much leverage. And our decisions about military action are colored by the experience of Iraq. Recall that the Israelis struck at the, um, the, the Israelis. I'm I'm, my history is va vague at the moment. Um, but there was an, uh, an Iraqi nuclear facility that was uh, attacked. And two years later, the Iraqi nuclear program had fully recovered and, and then was operating in a way where, where the capabilities were dispersed around the country. So in other words, even the military solution might not be a solution. 
Well, one imagines that if you'd gotten to the Pakistani who was selling secrets to the North Koreans, you could have eliminated his process, what he was doing, and thus not had to attack North Korea after the fact, but prevented them before the fact. Amen. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so describe the differences between the capabilities between land-based nuclear missiles and submarine-based, and then we'll ask about space. But first, the, just the two. What are the different uh, capabilities of land-based silos and submarine-based silos? So a, a land-based forest is, is ready to go right now. There are two young people in, down in command capsules sprinkled around the American West uh, with uh, the ability to launch on an order from the president within a minute from now. Mm -hmm. um, the submarine launches less prompt. You have to communicate. You have to find. You have to communicate with the submarine. It has to get to its launch position. Uh, so there's a question of. Uh, so they they differ in terms of their ability to act promptly. Uh, it's it's also the case that the land-based missiles are somewhat more precise, so they they can come closer to their target. Um, but the, the sea-based ones have improved. The the most important difference, though, is that the land-based capabilities are vulnerable, and the sea-based ones we 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 hope to be and believe to be not vulnerable. And thus, any country that attacks a country might think it can attack the United States ICBM force and eliminate most of our capabilities, but it can't believe that about our submarine force. And thus it must always contend with the probability of an American nuclear response. Uh, how effective are nuclear umbrellas, missile umbrellas? M missile defenses. Missile defenses that are umbrellas like we, we, like we give to the Israelis. Well, growing up in California, do, how many of you remember Nike missile sites? right out here on the island. Right. Well, they, they were nuclear tipped. And we, we abandoned that as soon as we could because having nuclear weapons go off just a couple of miles above Angel Island wouldn't have been a very good defense. It might have stopped the incoming missile, but it would have been uh, dangerous and harmful. Uh, in, in the 1980s, we, we mastered hit-to-kill technology. So, you know, rockets traveling through space, warheads traveling through space are going at 17,000 miles per hour or more. And um, we are able to launch a missile to hit that missile mm -hmm. and, and explode it or at least knock it off course. But this becomes a numbers game. The, the technology works. And if North Korea's got two missiles and we've got 50 interceptors, we're set. If North Korea's got 50 missiles and we've got two interceptors, our missile defense is worthless. Um, but we, we have said about our missile defense that we want it to be good enough to negate the coercive value of North Korea's growing force. And we're going to stay ahead but we don't want a, a, nuke, a missile defense so large as to call into question for China and Russia the credibility of their deterrence. Because if they believe we're trying to close out their deterrence, they believe the next thing is American bullying and coercion and attack. And so they're, they're going to work very hard to deny us the ability to defend ourselves from their attacks. So uh, if a nuclear sub sets off a missile, how many more missiles do they have armed in the sub? What's, how much of an armament do they have? And then same for silos. How many missiles in each? So our, our current fleet of ballistic missile submarines carry 24 missiles per boat. Uh, that will be reduced to 16 in the next generation force. Uh, and of, on those missiles, some carry multiple warheads. Um, independently targetable, independently targetable. Model? Yes. Okay. And this is a this is a remarkable technology from the 1960s, where, well, uh, I won't. We can go into that if you want, if you're interested. The um, and the land base. How the, many? How much? How many missiles does this land base silo have? So per silo, one missile. Okay. But silos. Um, how many do we have now? 350. 
Um, and of course, we would all think that the silos are located on a base. I mean, you go to an Air Force base, they have ICBMs there. No, they're sprinkled all around ranches and farmland, and, and they're just concrete block small structures uh, on, on a flat surface with a cap. And in time of war, the cap would pop off and off we'd go. Now, you said 17,000. That was a question I had. Um, we keep hearing about supersonic um, speed, missile speeds. So 17,000, one coming inbound from North Korea is going at 17,000. Our defense missile shooting at it or our three that are shooting at it, they're going 17,000 miles per hour. What about faster ones? I hear the Soviets are trying to build faster ones. What about well, how fast? So the term is hypersonic. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Everybody, are, everybody who has intercontinental range missiles, ballistic missiles, ballistic trajectory goes like that. Uh, when it's coming down like that, it's going, it's a hypersonic. It's traveling at very high rate of speed. 25,000? How fast? I'm not sure I know. Okay. What's in development are cruise missiles. Something on a ballistic trajectory, as soon as your computer figures out the trajectory, you have the possibility of intercepting it at any point on its arc. Okay. And especially if it's just coming down straight at you, you it's, it's, you've got a line of sight to it. Uh, a cruise missile, and cruise missiles travel through the atmosphere, so they historically, they, they go slower because they heat so much in the atmosphere. That you don't have the atmosphere out in outer space. And um, to have hypersonic cruise missiles means you can't plot where they're going to land because they're maneuverable. Uh, the Chinese did a test last year in which they shot the missile across the distance of China and then did a corkscrew in on their target. Um, and so, it's, so the, the, the virtue of a hypersonic cruise missile is not really its speed. It's, that's not its new contribution. It's the fact that it operates in this regime where defenses don't operate against it. So it's maneuverable, and that makes it harder to hit. And it travels at a horizontal trajectory instead of on a big arch. And, and the horizontal trajectory is harder to shoot because it's not going to be... Harder, well, you can't see it. Mm -hmm. It's over the horizon. Mm -hmm. You can see it from space if you've got the tracking system. Well, we, we, we haven't built that. That's gigantically expensive. So... Um, if we are China's biggest customer, how could they hurt us without hurting themselves? They can't. We can, and same for us. Yeah, there's, there's, there's no iron curtain between the United States and China. There's an iron curtain again between the United States and Russia. Um, porous, a lower curtain than before, but still not many common interests with Russia, and certainly not many economic common interests, but some. So what do we, to the point, to, so what do we get from Russia besides petroleum products and crime? Grief. <laughs> right. I think of it as a Russia tax. What percent of cyber criminals are Russia-based? Uh, I'd like to say not enough. Uh, by by that I mean they're cyber criminals, too many places. But well, yeah, the Ru Russians have perfected. Well, it's a state-sponsored activity. Right. We had as a previous speaker Jim Schwartz a couple of years ago, and he did one for us Oscars for documentaries, and the one he showed here was called Icarus, mm -hmm. and it uh, showed in uh, in a feature-length movie um, the state-sponsored spying activities. Uh, and cheating activities of the Soviets in the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And it was not like uh, Bicycle Racer A trying to cheat and uh, win a medal. It right. was state-sponsored cheating. Right. And so he said, when you have state-sponsored cheating, which is what the documentary is all about, it's like a whole other level, and it's right. so amazing. So we now see state-sponsored criminality. Seems to me that Russia is a kleptocracy. Is that wrong? No, it's quite correct so uh, it, uh, what about the 
it seems to me also that Russia benefits from global warming and sea level rise. Moscow is 300 feet above sea level and 600 miles from the shoreline. And as the climate warms, the northern Urals, which are filled with mineral deposits they own, become more accessible, less expensive to exploit. And as the northern shoreline warms up, they have their first blue water ports and the shortest sh shipping routes to anywhere. They don't go around, they go straight down. So is that why Russia is building up their um, ice-breaking um, navy up in the north in the Arctic? Or what well, are the reasons why they're doing that? I guess well, that's the, they're doing a lot in the Arctic other than building more, more icebreakers. Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're clearly preparing for military competition and conflict in that area. They, they already use it extensively to develop and test uh, advanced weapon systems. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's where they do their nuclear weapons development. Uh, their test facility is up in the, the Arctic. Um, and yes, they see an, an, an economic, commercial, and military advantage uh, of being, and, and they are the dominant Arctic power in terms of coast, coast, coastal access to, to the Arctic Sea. And of course, it's it's an area of great advantage over China because China is is not does not directly abut the Arctic. Mm -hmm. So now I'm going to keep asking questions because what a fascinating speaker to ask of questions. But if you have one, please put your hand up. John will bring you a microphone. Mike Milstein, right off the bat, has a question. Yeah. Is our uh, nuclear deterrence better served with uh, Biden or Trump as our next president? <laughs> well, I'm not here to express partisan views. Um, I don't. Uh, I, I know what President Biden's plan is, which is to modernize and strengthen both central strategic and theater nuclear deterrence. And to do that, to strengthen deterrence, not just by nuclear means, but to roll in missile defense, conventional strike, cyber resilience, space capabilities, etc. The administration calls that integrated deterrence. And that's a move in the right direction. Now, the Trump administration, um, under S Secretary of Defense Mattis, produced a nuclear posture review, which is the main policy document at the beginning of an administration, that was, that was like the one I produced when I, when I was the Obama nuclear posture review guy. Uh, many of the same themes, yes, some, a few differences, but, but not many. Uh, and so, the, essentially, the, the Trump administration, one, pursued mainstream nuclear policy. The question that's on the table about the Trump administration, number two, is t twofold. One, um, he's talked about withdrawing from NATO. Uh, he's talked about ending the Ukraine war in one day. The way to end the Ukraine war in one day is to accept the peace treaty the Russians have offered at the start of the war, which among its eight provisions includes the provision that the United States withdraw its nuclear weapons from Europe. Um, he's, I said, two, two, two issues. It's, it's around the theme of extended deterrence. The, the, the President Trump might close the nuclear umbrella. So this question would have seemed preposterous a decade ago, but is America stronger with NATO or without NATO? Well, I believe with NATO. Is there any question? Well, apparently a, a small fraction. I mean, the American people, when polled about their views of our allies, poll between 85 and 90 percent in support of alliances and see them as a source of strength for us. But clearly there's a senior group that doesn't. So it seems to me that we're like 6% of the world population and we get most of our strength by sitting atop an alliance, a pyramid of alliances created after World War II where we have all these other alliance partners who are part of our team. And it seems going alone would be just unthinkably not as effective as trying to be, as we are now, the leader of this big alliance. Poke holes in that thesis. Well, I, I can't. I mean, the, the, other side of, the other side of this is we Americans much prefer to go in a posse than to go as the sheriff alone. And the, f the fact that we might not have mem members of a posse to join us in dealing with some threat to our security that's somewhere else in the world increases the odds that we won't. 
And, and the perception that we might not is exactly what would encourage the aggression in the first place. Questions from the audience? Angus. Uh, Ron, uh, this is actually uh, uh, on the live feed. Uh, I have two viewers from Iceland. We're very popular in Iceland. Good. Uh, Gordon Smith asks, I'm watching this presentation from Denmark. Oh, correction, Denmark. It's very informing. What role does the Arctic and Greenland play in the relations between the USA and Russia seen in the light of your presentation? And let me go ahead and ask uh, the second question, which is from Iceland. I'm watching from Iceland. We have newly allowed American subs permission to dock here for, for provisions, given that they have no nuclear warheads on board. Where, where is it most difficult to operate? Well, I can't really comment on the operational aspects of this. Thank you. Um, but the... Uh, the, the general qu question to, to, to wh wh where do they fit into this discussion I've had? N NATO has a nuclear deterrent of its own. Um, it, NATO has three nuclear armed members, the United States, the United Kingdom, and France. But it also has sharing arrangements, whereby another handful of countries, a classified list, but you can find it anywhere on the internet, it's an open fact, of countries that, partic that own the aircraft that would deliver our bombs under our president's authority in time of, of war. This is a responsibility that only a few NATO allies take on, but others try to support in various ways. NATO, and NATO has generally been reluctant to talk about these things because in a few countries, there are really highly motivated disarmament groups that would rather see these sharing arrangements ended and leave it to us to do the work of bearing the risk of nuclear deterrence. And so uh, my, my advice to Denmark and Iceland is that um, they participate in NATO's nuclear policy discourse and that they consider joining the, the conventional air cover operations that, that support NATO's nuclear mission. It's a shared <coughs> responsibility deterrence. Where are Russia's Where are Russia's most worrisome silos from an American perspective? Where are they located? Well, any silo of theirs can launch a missile capable of striking the United States. So, because they're as fast as they are, where they're located doesn't really make them more or less dangerous. Correct. The location is not the issue. And it's really not the speed, it's just their, their, their size and throw weight. They can travel great long distances carrying multiple warheads. Where would Russia strike first if they did? I have no idea. China? No idea what their war plans are. I mean, the, the, any, anyone who has nuclear weapons has to have a theory for pers convincing themselves that if they have to use them, it's going to work out okay. And the only way it's going to work out okay if you've launched a nuclear weapon against some other country's homeland is that they choose to stop rather than bear the cost of more such attacks. And thus, you're, not, you're probably not going to attack with everything you've got because that will assure a massive response. So you might convince yourself that you can get away with a, a, a pinprick to show, not that a nuclear weapon's a pinprick, but a a single weapon or a small number for the purpose of making us confront the possibility that there might be a lot more and we'd better stand down. So where they would attack, I don't know. How they might attack, I think, with very few to start. So China has around 200 warheads. Now, how many do they have right at this point? About three. three some, they don't say. Yeah, but our best guess. Three to 500. Okay, and they're trying to get to... A thousand by the end of the decade? They, they don't know. They, they won't say. They're, they're building the capacity to get to 15 to 2,000, 1,500 to 2,000 by 2035. So if we've got 350 silos, they've got to have at least what, how many number more than that if they had such crazy idea as to basically attack all of our silos? Well... 
if you really, really want to be sure that you're going to destroy the target you're attacking, you'd better attack it with more than one weapon. Yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Three? How many? So, I don't, it depends on how they calculate the accuracy and yield of their weapons and their confidence that their weapons will go off. They've been developing weapons, but they haven't been able to test them because of the nuclear test moratorium that's been in place since 1993. It's, it's a good thing that they have to worry about that. <laughs> exactly. Another question from the floor. So if you're advising the president uh, today to get us kind of, oh, till these new nuclear weapons are developed and deployed, um, let's say over the next 10 to 15 years, what steps would you advise the president to take to increase our deterrence both in theater and strategic? Well, I think the, the, the first thing is what we say rather than what we do. Um, so if you take the argument that Russia has built a nuclear scalpel for every military problem in Europe over the last decade, what have we done over the last decade? We've life extended a few dozen nuclear bombs. And we've struggled to renew our production capacity for nuclear weapons, which we destroyed in 1994 and 5. And many NATO allies are kind of embarrassed to have to talk about nuclear weapons. Very few capitals in Europe say anything about nuclear deterrence. Putin's pushing. How would he look at that historical record? I, I think he would think, well, these guys aren't very serious. And uh, there was a, an, another commission that met in 2006 that said there, there are a lot of signs of a lack of focus on nuclear deterrence and problems with the level of staffing and the quality of the people and the, uh, a long list of complaints. And we've done very little, despite a lot of effort by the political appointees, to fix these problems. And the cumulative effect, I mean, I, I recently went back and reread stories about the, the, the history of 1939, 40, and 41, where the <laughs> leaders of our enemies assessed that the military balance favored us. But our lack of resolve as demonstrated in a decade of behavior indicated that we were divided and too weak to defend our interests politically. That's the problem I want to fix for deterrence. Uh, and I think the first way you do that is by stop making it sound like you're embarrassed to have to talk about nuclear deterrence or that there's something morally questionable about protecting yourself by nuclear means. Uh, and, and so I would like to see the president endorse the findings of the Strategic Posture Commission from October. Uh, and, and I would like to see the president prioritize efforts to renew the extended nuclear deterrent. Bravo. Because we can do a lot more to assure our allies quickly that will that will buttress deterrence in both Europe and Northeast Asia. Bravo. Uh, Captain Janagian has a question. Thank you. Bruce Janagian. One observation and one question. The observation is this subject has become much more relevant, it seems to me, because sanctions have not been seen to work around the world. Uh, and uh, uh, so I just want to hold that thought. The question I have for you is an electromagnetic pulse and how that may work. Ron mentioned uh, a number of missiles being necessary to affect our ICBMs, but one electromagnetic pulse over the center of the United States, in my understanding, would be enough to cook all of the electronics that would be necessary to launch these things. Your thoughts, please? Well, I th we don't actually understand electromagnetic pulse effects of nuclear weapons very well. We conducted only one test in our, in, in, when we were actively testing nuclear weapons up until 1992, we conducted over a thousand explosive tests, most of them underground in Nevada, but not, but not the earlier tests. Uh, but only one of those thousand plus was designed for the purpose of trying to understand electromagnetic pulse effects. Uh, and, and it does suggest that you can get very wide area effects, <coughs> especially over lo long line transmissions. Um, it may be that there are expedients. Um, I mean, if you, if, if, you, if you observe a launch and shut your computer off, 
uh, and turn it back on. Uh, the, the, the effect may be very short-lived in some instances, in other words. So we don't understand this very well. But the idea that um, this would somehow provide uh, an escape from the dilemmas of deterrence for our adversaries, I, I don't buy that idea. So let's say, Russia. in answer to your question, Russia doesn't do what I project, um, strike with four nuclear weapons on on um, non-urban targets, but instead comes with a, a weapon that explodes in the atmosphere and, and has electromagnetic pulse effects, and, and, it's, and let's presuppose that it, it's effective in shutting down all of our electronic systems permanently. Well, we'd have a lot of people starving. We'd have a whole lot of traffic deaths on the highway. We'd have people dying in hospitals. We'd have no food supply. We'd have no water. Um, this would look like war to us. It would be war. Uh, and our threat to do something awful in response to the perpetrator of this act would be pretty credible, and it would be clear who the perp perpetrator was because we could see where the missile came from that delivered this device. So yes, there are all sorts of technical nasties in the world. In all of these domains I talked about, cyberspace, outer space, submarine warfare, uh, the list go AI, the list goes on. But the reality is if you do grievous harm to another country, uh, unless you can bring them absolutely to their knees and change their political system, they can do grievous harm to you in exchange. So uh, Russia recently failed to land a spaceship effectively on the moon. How do we know, and what's your assessment of the functional capability of their nuclear missile force well, they, they test it periodically. Um, their force is newer than ours uh, by, by a good bit. We've had some How tests. How old? What are the age averages? Well, they've, they, they are just completing a cycle of modernization of their nuclear forces. Uh, and uh, Putin gave a speech two weeks ago in which he said, We're, we've replaced 93% of our hardware in 12 years. Um, so we, we don't know, but the, the Chinese have debated how many nuclear weapons are enough to get America to back down. Uh -huh. how, many, how, many, how many do we have to worry about reaching our cities or military assets? And the, the Chinese debate whether the answer is one or just maybe one. For the Russians, the answer is, according to unclassified articles, 340. And if you're going to fire 340 nuclear-tipped missiles at the United States, it doesn't matter if 20 of them don't go off. It doesn't matter if half of them don't go off. You will still have killed many millions of people. Uh, and this is anathema to our way of thinking. We, we're, we want to be sure that if, if the president ever has to employ a, these weapons in this kind of dire, extreme emergency, that they work exactly as intended. And, and moreover, that no one else can influence them to work or not work. So in 1939, America embargoed petroleum coming out of, or kept um, petroleum from getting to Japan. Uh, many argued later on that that was ultimately the reason why they attacked us at Pearl Harbor. Others argue that, and speakers on our stage have said, that was deliberately done by America because the Roosevelt administration wanted to prompt such a war. Uh, what about those crazy people who think, and I've used that term, pardon me, who think that our economic sanctions on Russia are deliberately provoking them? Why are, and so let me ask you, do you think it was a good or bad thing that we put economic sanctions on Russia? Well, that's a loaded question with everything you t teed up behind it. Yeah, that's why I did that. Um, uh, but net, sanctions net, net, are net, sanctions. Net, net, net. Is it good or bad that we had economic sanctions in place? They're better than the alternative, which is either doing nothing or going to war. We resort to them too often to avoid that choice between doing nothing and, and going to war. Sanctions are much easier to put on than to take off. Uh, and, and at a certain point, they become helpful to the regime in building political support for the case that the regime's being attacked from the outside and the people need to stand to defend their state. 
So sanctions are great, but only, only as a short-term fix and an expedient. Um, well, there's more to be said, but there are more questions from the floor. I, I'm looking for uh, any a question. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I, I want to thank you for coming today, Doctor. A uh, quick question. At night, I think if, um, if we have nuclear war, it's not a question of if we have nuclear war, but when we have a nuclear war. And can you offer any ray of hope that my reasoning might be off? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I would have the same view. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, different, and Sunday, I drink. <laughs> um, Drinking might be the answer to to. Uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the the first answer is seventy years. We've lived in an anarchic international system with a lot of conflict, and nuclear weapons haven't been used in anger again since their their first two two uses, a short period apart. That's a surprise. That's certainly not what was expected in the 50s and 60s. Um, we expected a lot of nuclear proliferation, so additional states. John Kennedy spoke about the fact that within 20 years there would be 20 to 30 nuclear armed states. Hasn't happened. Um, it's, nuclear weapons have great coercive potential, great coercive value. They scare people. We all remember the mushroom clouds. But to actually employ them, um, first of all, you, you, do, you have no idea what your enemy is going to do in response, probably something terrible. You have no idea what's going to happen in the international community uh, that, that might bear on your interests. You have no idea how your public is going to react. Imagine an American president employs a nuclear weapon tomorrow in a manner that a lawyer or a just, just war theorist m might say is just. Imagine the American political debate afterwards. And would that president survive that debate politically? I mean, t to me, it's just... Uh, so d d d deterrence is a theory of shaping an, a, an, a competitor's behavior by influencing their calculus of the benefit, costs, and risks of different courses of action, including the course of inaction. The role of nuclear weapons is in the risk calculus, not the cost calculus. And in the risk, risk calculus, it's just so much unquantifiable risk, unknowable risk to cross that threshold. Uh, President Putin wants us to believe, Kim Jong-un wants us to believe that his nuclear threats, their nuclear threats, are very credible. And if we infringe their interests too much, hell's going to break down upon us. That's what they want us to believe. And it might. But it would likely on them as well. And that's a pretty strong incentive to not go there, to try and f find success by some other means, some other course of action. So I... I, I don't believe the nuclear problem today is, is as bad as it was during the Cold War. I think the risks of nuclear Armageddon in the 1950s and 60s were real uh, and then became too much for the leaders of the United States and Soviet Union to bear, and they became status quo powers. I hope I've given you some reassurance. Dr. Brad Roberts, Director of the Center for Global Strategic Research at Lawrence Livermore Lab. Thank you for sharing your wisdom with the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank Great. you. Thank Bravo. You. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome to keep asking. Welcome to keep asking the doctor questions. He's an incredible, um, knowledgeable person on the topic, as you can tell. And we're going to now get this. Here we go. Meetings adjourned.
This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.